And we'll, we'll begin with hymn number 157 from the supplemental hymnal, My Soul Now Bless Thy Maker. Amen. Now we're going to be led in prayer by uh, Pastor Mickey Snyder. Mickey's been a a friend for almost 50 years. (laughs) And he's been a mentor and a helper and an encourager. And it's been a great blessing to have him. And it's a great blessing to have him with us uh, this week. So Mickey, will you come and pray? Let us pray. Oh, Lord, our God. We bind unto ourselves today the strong name of the Trinity by invocation of your name, the three in one and one in three. We bind this day to ourselves forever the power of faith, Christ's incarnation, his baptism in the Jordan River, his death on the cross for our salvation, 
his bursting from the spicy tomb, his riding up the heavenly way, his coming on the day of doom, we bind unto ourselves today your power, O God, to hold and lead, your eye to watch, your might to stay, your ear to hearken to our need, the wisdom of our God to teach, your hand to guide, your shield to award, your word, O God, to give us speech, your heavenly host to be our guard. Christ, be with us, Christ within us, Christ behind us, Christ before us, Christ beside us, Christ to win us, Christ to comfort and restore us, Christ beneath us, Christ above us, Christ in quiet, Christ in danger, Christ in hearts of all that love us, Christ in mouth of friend and stranger. We bind unto ourselves the name, the strong name of the Trinity, by invocation of the same, the three in one and one in three, of whom all nature hath creation, eternal Father, Spirit word, praise to the God of our salvation. Salvation is of Christ the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let me quick give you some quick reminders. First of all, remember we have a question and answer session uh, after our second session this morning just before lunch, so please get your uh, questions in so we can cover those. Remember also uh, about lunch uh, today and tomorrow, Lotus Club today, and you, if you still have not notified us, Jackie uh, Peacock, who is sitting at the Athanasius table, or at least she was, check with her and make sure she knows you want to come. We'll be giving um, some more information about the Lotus Club at, at, uh, at the end of the question and answer session today. Remember the book table out there as well. Now let me introduce our next uh, speaker. It's, it's Pastor Bill Smith. Bill is the pastor of Cornerstone Reformed Church in Carbondale, Illinois. You know that we had originally scheduled or planned to have Ken Myers in our conference, but Ken unfortunately had a medical issue and was unable to come. And so he called at like just December, the you know first week in December. And so he just immediately almost had a heart attack. But I remembered... Bill used to be a Baptist, and Baptists, you know, they don't need, they don't, they just speak. They can speak all the time. They, they fill with the Spirit, and they got, they got talks. They can just start going. So I thought, of, I thought of Bill. We met when he was actually still a Baptist. He had become a Pado Baptist, and he later became, he and the church in Sulphur became Presbyterian. And now he served a PCA church in Louisville. Kentucky, and now he's in Carbondale, Illinois, and he's really qualified to speak on this, and I, I know of the, of the topic, and he's really ready to do that. But the main reason I wanted to get Bill, and I thought maybe this might be an encouragement to him, is he is an LSU fan, and it's just been sad, sad two years. He's fought with depression. Uh, it's just been awful. And I thought, you know, this would be, you know, Alabama fans are known for their consideration and compassion. And so I, th I thought this would be encouraging for Bill. He can come and have friends, everybody, everybody encourage him, and it would be really nice. And so that, that's really the thing. I just wanted you to know the motivation behind all this. But Bill is married to a wonderful woman named Susan of 31, 31 years they've been married. They have six children, four grandchildren. Welcome, Bill Smith. Well, it is an honor to be here, and I know that I was at least the second or third choice. Um, and we're all disappointed that Ken is not here, but uh, I am honored to be here to follow up an Alabama fan. It's just uh, a dream come true. Uh, so, you know if you're an LSU fan, that's being very sarcastic. No, it is, it is an honor to be here. I'm, I'm so old, I remember that this used to be the pastor's conference, and this used to be Auburn Avenue, and it used to be controversial to be here, um, but now not so much. So uh, Steve has mellowed out in his, in his later years, and so we're, we're glad for that. But anyway, let's, uh, let's pray once again and uh, begin. Father, we pray that, I pray that the 
words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight. O Jesus, our rock and our near kinsman. Amen. We live in a chronically anxious society. Tension fills the air like an explosive gas ready for a catalyst. This isn't merely a nervousness among people, although that certainly is involved. But, dare I say, it's a systemic feature of a culture that is becoming balkanized through identity politics, intersectionality, critical race theory, COVID, and other factors. We know the anxiety has matured to the breaking point when comedians must line up with political correctness. We can't be playful and joke about our differences anymore without being accused of sexism, racism, or some other type of oppressive hatred. If someone jokes or acts in a way that runs contrary to the victimization du jour, he is accused of being a troublemaker. In the reality, he's the, only one, he's the one who struck the match. The explosive agent was already in the air. Instead of diffusing the gas, eliminating the anxiety, it is easier to scapegoat the match striker. This type of chronic anxiety can affect us at every level of society, interpersonal relationships, families, and yes, churches. For almost two years, our country has been anxious because of COVID. Government officials who have the impossible expectations of many in the citizenry to keep them safe from everything have scrambled to eliminate any threats. Combined with their insatiable wicked desires for dominating power in everything and in league with many in the medical industry, they have filled the country with this noxious, anxious gas that only needs a spark to explode. This anxiety has gripped and still grips many churches. Masks and vaccines in the name of love for neighbor have become flammable fumes as church members deal with the illness, the death of loved ones, and or the loss of jobs. Recently, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, said in an interview that being vaccinated and getting your booster are about love for your neighbor. And while he stops short of explicitly calling it a sin to be unvaccinated, the implication that you don't love your neighbor if you are unvaccinated leads people to the conclusion that they are violating the second of the two great commandments. Imagine the crises of consciences for the unvaccinated as well as the pride for the vaccinated. This is a recipe for anxiety within the church. Many people see the answer as being to eliminate the match strikers in order to keep the peace. Consequently, relationships are built around the dysfunctional the anxious, the fearful, the dysfunctional members. Appeasement becomes the course of action, whether it is the Foot Locker, Walmart, or other corporations giving hundreds of millions of dollars to BLM, families ordering their lives around the angry or overly fearful member, pastors and elders walking on eggshells around an unhealthy leader or family in the church, or leaders becoming a part of the anxiety themselves. The only thing that happens is that anxiety increases and brings relationships to breaking points. A decimated society, destroyed friendships, divorce, church splits. Appease, 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 and then when everything blows up, and it will blow up, the match striker is blamed. Everyone gets into a new set of relationships and carries that way of relating into the next situation to start it all over again. The need in any and all of these anxious relationships is leadership. Someone who refuses to become a, become a part of the system and provides people a way out of living this way. In society, this should be our government officials. Quite frankly, they see too much opportunity to seize power and personal wealth to eliminate the anxiety that bolsters all of this for them. Societal anxiety is the path to greater power. In the church, this person must be the pastor and with him the elders in unified steadfast leadership. In a home, it should be the husband or the father. Nothing is foolproof. Nothing works mechanically or formulaically, but without good leadership, you can be assured that the health of a congregation or any family or organization for that matter will be compromised. So what I will teach in these two talks is the role of leadership, particularly the need for masculine leadership in dealing with congregational anxiety. The same principles can be applied to societies and homes, but I'm focusing on the church and how the church can remain steadfast during these anxious times. 
Now, the first order of business is understanding what chronic anxiety is. There is not a dictionary definition. It is better described than defined. And some of you might recognize some of my terminology and allusions if you have read The Failure of Nerve by Edwin Friedman. He was a Jewish rabbi who, of course, had theological issues, but this book is excellent and highly recommended. Much of the book is taken up with describing chronic anxiety. He uses the illustration of it being an explosive gas that permeates the atmosphere of relationships. And there are several characteristics that key you into its presence. The first one is reactivity. There are vicious cycles of intense reactions to each member, uh, of each member to events and one another and the loss of capacity for playfulness. Friedman notes, highly reactive families are a panic in search of a trigger. Everyone is on edge, something like always having a chip on your shoulder. Everything is highly serious. There is no laughter. Relaxation and playfulness are seen as not taking the situation seriously. A second characteristic is hurting moving everyone to adapt to the least mature and or most dysfunctional members. This is not proper care for the weak or dysfunctional member, as we are called to do. We are never encouraged to adopt the weakness of the weak as the standard for everyone. And he certainly doesn't tell us to build the church around its most dysfunctional members. All that we do in terms of accommodation of the weak is to lead them to strength, the dysfunctional Those living in unhealthy, sinful patterns of life are called to repent and join the maturing, healthy members. And of course, as Friedman points out, those who stand against this herding will often be characterized as cruel, heartless, insensitive, unfeeling, uncooperative, selfish, and cold. That, my friends, is one of the prices of leadership. A third characteristic of chronic anxiety is blame displacement. Becoming victims instead of taking responsibility for one's own well-being and destiny. There is, of course, a communal responsibility for one another. I'll talk more about this relationship in the second talk. There are no real hard and fast lines that can be clearly defined as to where the communal responsibility ends and the individual responsibility begins. However, we do know that there are differences because there are distinctions between the one and the many, the individual, and the community. There are things and responsibilities that are mine and not mine, that are yours and not yours. Anxious communities are filled with individual members who refuse to take responsibility for their own health. You weren't there for me. My child apostatized because the church didn't have enough for the young people. That pastor doesn't care about anyone. These and many more are blame statements that you will hear from people who seek to be justified in their own inactive self-care, but must find a reason, a justification, for why their lives and families are in such a mess. A fourth characteristic is a quick-fix mentality, constantly seeking symptom relief rather than willingness to fundamentally change. These groups and individuals want the emotional equivalent of an ibuprofen while they continue to hit themselves in the head with an emotional hammer. They want symptom relief without changing their behavior. This is like a college football fan base that wants to hire a coach one year and have a national championship team the next year, something I expect Brian Kelly to do at LSU. We can't wait and build. With the money we are paying you, and it is a lot of money, you ought to be able to do this now, and you need to keep doing it over and over and over again. Yes, like Alabama, you need to do that. The pastor must deal with these issues when he comes into an anxious congregation or pastors a congregation that has become anxious who wants him to fix everything immediately. He is supposed to have the right scripture verse, the powerful sermon, or something that will change the church into a healthy body overnight? The answer is, of course, as Proverbs exhorts, gathering little by little slow changes and small graces, being content with 1% change, as James Clear outlines in his book, Atomic Habits, as he stumbles on the Solomonic wisdom little by little. You as a leader must not become a part of their anxiety by expecting to have the answers they want. 
That only heightens the anxiety because it creates unrealistic expectations with you and those in the church. You don't have all the answers. You can't fix everything now. But anxious people and societies are impatient. They want formulaic, sure, quick answers. Once again, Friedman is on point. As with personal families, the desire for a quick fix throughout the greater American family evidences a search for certainty, a penchant for easy answers, an avoidance of the struggles that go into growth, and an unwillingness to accept the short-term acute pain that one must experience in order to reduce chronic anxiety. The fifth characteristic, and the one upon which I will focus, is the lack of self-differentiated leadership. This is a failure of nerve that contributes to and perpetuates the first four. And this is where I'm going to focus and to see how this is realized in masculine leadership. Now, Friedman's list may not be perfect, but it is a good place from which to work. I believe he accurately describes the nature of much of chronic anxiety. And having been a pastor for 30 plus years now, I've seen this in the church over and over again. As he mentions in the fifth aspect, chronic anxiety is to a large part due to the lack of self-differentiated leadership. But why? Why is the lack of leadership, especially masculine leadership in the church, the cause of anxiety? The answers are rooted in our creation, the way and purposes for which we are created. The epitome of masculine leadership is Jesus himself, the faithful Adam. Viewing him through creation and creation through him, we can understand what leadership looks like and the gifts that it provides those being led. So we focus now on leadership, the masculine responsibility. And then in the next talk, the masculine presence. A truth that we learn from Paul quite clearly is that the manner in which creation took place, as well as the order of creation, have meaning. When Paul says to Timothy that the man was created first, and therefore he is the one who is to be leading in worship, not the woman, he clearly indicates that the order of creation has meaning. Not just what God created, not just what God said, but the order in which he did it. The purpose of our being created, male and female, is also wrapped up in the order of creation, as well as God's explicitly stated reasons. Paul tells the Corinthians, based on creation... That the woman was made for the man, not man for the woman. This also contributes to understanding that, that role of man in leadership. Now don't mistake this for saying that the man does not need the woman. Paul makes it clear that neither is independent of the other. Originally, the woman was made for man, but now man is born of woman. But to say that the man is not independent of the woman, that he needs the woman, does not negate what Paul said earlier about the woman being made for the man in 1 Corinthians eleven nine, or that the authoritative structure between man and woman is revealed in the original order of creation, as he says in 1 Timothy 2 and again in 1 Corinthians 11. Codependence is complementary, not egalitarian. Indeed, the cosmos is patriarchal. This is the way God created and sustains his order. Now, the word patriarchy has fallen into disfavor, and some may want to abandon it. With the abuses that some of us have seen with tyrannical patriarchalism, our tendency is to throw the patriarchal baby out with the masculine bathwater. We simply want to be complementarian and thin complementarians at that, bordering on egalitarianism. But we shouldn't be so quick to abandon patriarchy. In fact, we can't. And though I'm not inexorably bound to it, it's a fine word to use. I would even argue that it's a biblical Word. When Paul says in Ephesians 3.14 that he bows his knee to the father, the pater, from whom every family, the patria, a derivative of pater, when he says that he bows his knee to the father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, he is among other things indicating that the world is patriarchal. The world is named by the father. The, wor the, the world is not a mater, a mother. There is a place for her, but the world is primarily named by the Father in every family. The world and family in it derive their origin and are under the authority of the Father, the patriarch, and the families, households, as well as nations, fatherlands, image that fatherhood. 
The Father is the source and their authority. When Peter quotes the promise given to Abraham in Genesis 12, and you all the families of the earth shall be blessed, he uses the same word Paul uses in Ephesians 3.14. That promise is given to Abraham in Genesis 12 is restated with variation in Genesis 18 and 22. The nations are blessed in Abraham. Now, I don't believe these things are at odds. Nations are extended families. The table of nations in Genesis 10 is a family lineage. The place from which we hail is our fatherland. Families and nations are named by him, taking on his name of father. And so patriarchy is perfectly acceptable to describe the, structure, the, the, the structure of the created order. This order takes on flesh in the distinctions between men and women in creation that become archetypal structures for the ectypal structures of masculine-feminine relationships. God created the man to be the primary ruler of the home, the church, and society. The woman's role includes rule with the man, but that rule is not the same kind and is derivative from and subordinate to the man. We see this in the two Adams. Though the woman is included in the name Adam, eventually, Adam was Adam before the creation of the woman, having the responsibility for the mission God gave him. He wasn't glorified Adam, but he was Adam nevertheless. When the woman was created, though she was distinct, she was given his name in order to join and help him with the mission God gave him. They have a responsibility of dominion, but it is the man's responsibility in a way that it is not the woman's. Christ Jesus, the second Adam, is the man who takes up the responsibility with authority in a way that the church never could. The church has a responsibility. It has a responsibility with Christ, but the church is not responsible for the mission in the same way that Christ Jesus is, nor does she share the authority with Christ in an undifferentiated way. The church suffers with Christ, and that suffering can be vicarious in some sense, as Paul indicates in various places, but it is only so because of the primary suffering, death, and resurrection of Christ Jesus. Our suffering is vicarious. Our suffering is effective, efficacious, because Christ Jesus has suffered, and we suffered in and with him. The church rules with Christ in heavenly places, but to say the church is Lord in the same way we say Jesus is Lord is blasphemous. In contrast to this relationship is the antithetical patriarchy, Satan, the one who through history is trying to seize the bride for his own and raise up his own seed. He is the father of lies. In John 8, there is a battle of patriarchies in homes, churches, and societies reflect to one degree or another one of these two structures. The world is patriarchal. It is its ontology, it's its being. This is embodied primarily in males being responsible for the mission of dominion in the world, not only in the church, but in the family and in societies. The patriarchy is masculine or male responsibility. When Paul says, for example, that the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, these are not arbitrary roles or thin types. They are not merely superficial roles assigned to males that could just as well be handled by females, only held back by bald prohibition by God. Patriarchy is reality. This, uh, this is why the structures that feminism creates and desires will never, ever work. They defy the patriarchal structure of reality. Defying the patriarchal structure of reality is like defying gravity. You can do it but it's not going to end well. We must work with the grain of reality, the way God created and sustains the world, and that involves men owning the leadership responsibility given to them. As we look at creation through these lenses, we can understand the nature of the male-female and masculine-feminine relationship. Now, this relationship was not just between a man and his wife, though it was this, of course. This was the archetypal relationship that established the way the whole project of dominion was to be taken. To sum up, men are called to lead, women are called to help, men are called to initiate, women are called to respond and complete or glorify. Men advance and take the land, setting up and protecting walls and boundaries. Women work within those garden lands, making them beautiful. This is not only true in marriage, but it is true throughout societies. Where it is ignored, we do so to our peril. 
And while masculine leadership is a standard throughout all of societal structures as embodied in this archetypal relationship, something that we can tease out through doing biblical theology, masculine leadership in the sanctuary is not something we have to tease out, even though we do need to consider the setting. The garden was a sanctuary, the place where God would meet with man at the trees that were in the midst of the garden. The fruit of those trees was sacramental fruit, the tree of life being the fundamental sacrament given to man. Now, before the woman was created, God created the man, gave him the mission of dominion, planted the, planted the garden, gave him access to the tree of life, forbade the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and told him to work and guard the garden. And after this, remember order is important, after this, God created the woman to be his helper, to help him complete his mission. Because she is created in the garden, she becomes a part of the garden ministry uh, that he is to work, guard, and make fruitful. His leadership is for her as well as for the rest of creation. She and the world need this masculine leadership. This is a fundamental need in the world. That masculine leadership is summarized in the two duties given to man before the woman was created, work and guard the garden. Masculine leadership covers much more than one can put in a simple dictionary definition. Work and guard assume many strengths and skills that need to be developed and are expansive to the whole of what it means to be a man. Recognizing these limitations, I will summarize masculine leadership as the responsibility coupled with the authority to protect and provide for the feminine so that she can have the safety and provision that she needs to help him complete his mission. He glorifies her through protection and provision, and she glorifies him through glorifying what he gives her. Interestingly, the feminine is both the dirt from which the man comes, the earth, Adama, as well as the woman who is created to be his helper. Adam is, the, is a husbandman, a farmer. He is a husbandman to the earth and to the woman. He provides for and protects both so that they can help him bring his mission to completion. He comes from Mother Earth in order to save her. Masculine leadership provides direction and purpose. This is done archetypically in creation and in Christ giving his church the commission to disciple the nations. He has made the way, he has planted the garden, he has provided the boundaries, and now he's given his church a place to work. Masculine leadership equips with resources. Christ provides the church the spirit, as well as the gift of pastors and teachers who empower and equip the saints for the work of the ministry, respectively. This is done in the home as husbands provide seed for the wife so that she can develop it into a child, protecting her while she is in her most vulnerable state of being pregnant. He provides resources so that she can glorify the home. She glorifies what he gives her in order to glorify him so that he may complete the mission God has given to him. In Proverbs 31, the woman does all that she does so that her husband will be prominent in the gates when he sits among the elders. That's at the middle of a chiasm in Proverbs 31. When he sits among the gates, he is exalted because of all of her wisdom. His prominence at the gates is at the center of, of praise for lady wisdom. These masculine responsibilities to work and guard the garden ministry are made later as the Levites are given the same charge with regard to the tabernacle, the new post-fall garden complete with trees and cherubim. Work and guard are the, priestly, are, a, are the priestly ministry. The same two commands given to Adam in Genesis 2.15 are repeated concerning the Levites in Numbers 3, 5 through 10. Adam is a priest in the sanctuary, and one of the priest's duties is to teach. Adam, having received the word, was to teach his wife about everything, including the trees. And when it was time, Adam would give the fruit of the tree to his wife. He was responsible for the sacramental ministry to his wife. Masculine leadership in the sanctuary is God's plan from the beginning. It is something that he has held true through the years of our history until today. Just as in the beginning when all, all this was reversed in the fall and the woman takes the sacramental fruit and gives it to the man, assuming his role, bringing chaos and destruction, so it is still today when women take the lead, especially in the sanctuary. 
This order of creation defines the nature of masculine, feminine, male, female relationships. We are oriented to one another in terms of God's created order. The man is created to lead, to be a protector and provider, and the woman is oriented to the man so that she needs his masculine protection and provision, whether she wants to believe it or not, or whether he wants to believe it or not. This is true in intersexual relationships, and it is true in organizations and societies. The man's leadership expressed in his defining the mission, teaching the mission, protecting the woman, and other responsibilities are all what the woman needs, and when she is honest, what she desires. She's able to fulfill her purpose when the man fulfills his, and vice versa, but I'm focused on the man. She is created with this need for masculine leadership, when it is, and when it is not present, you guessed it, it creates anxiety. The relationship between the pastor and the elders who share some of his ministry and the congregation is a masculine-feminine relationship. And what might get confusing here is that the church is made up of men as well as women, yet as a whole, the church is feminine. This is because masculine-feminine relationships are not always male-female relationships. When the masculine-feminine relationship is derived from the archetypal relationships between the man and the woman... Masculine-feminine relationships can also be between those of the same sex or even females taking a masculine role and males taking a feminine role. For instance, when Paul speaks about the relationship between the Father and Christ in 1 Corinthians 11, he uses this, he uses this as an analogy of the authority structure between the man and the woman in the church. The Father is the head of Christ. The man is the head of the woman. He makes that analogy. Moses stands in a, relation, in a masculine relationship to Joshua as his deacon who occupies a feminine position. A general stands as a masculine to the feminine colonel in the military. A mother stands in a masculine relationship to her minor son who is to obey her. Pastors are in a masculine relationship to the church as a whole even though there are many males within the church. Pastors also stand in a masculine relationship to the feminine elders and deacons, though they are males. So while all masculine-feminine relationships aren't male-female relationships, all masculine-feminine relationships are derived from the original male-female relationship. And consequently, the need for masculine leadership relies upon males, men. Women, for example, who stand in a masculine relationship with their children derive their ability to do so well from their relationship to their husbands. Women are derivative from and oriented to the man. So, for instance, in a home, the woman is better able to exhibit a masculine presence with her children when her husband is providing her with masculine leadership. She is less anxious because she is safe with him. This provides her the ability to be a better mother to her children. And so while women may occupy masculine roles in some relationships, they are still dependent upon men giving them what they need in order to do so. When men don't fulfill their responsibilities, women are burdened in ways that they were not created to bear. This is why fatherless homes are such a problem. It is not merely that the children need a father, which is true. But the mother needs a husband in order to be the best mother she can be to the children. Now, can they step out and do things that they weren't designed to do? Can you have single moms and single dads? Well, yes, to some degree, but they can't do it well, not as they were designed. Duct tape may be able to hold a radiator hose in place to get you where you need to go, but it needs clamp. God is gracious with the stopgap measures we employ because of sin and its effects, but we should not be presumptuously slothful in our responsibilities because God is gracious. Shall we continue in improper intersexual relationships so the grace may abound? God forbid. We don't merely want to get by. We want to know and grow into the fullness of all that God created us to be. These stopgap measures cannot be employed in the church. We know from direct teaching in the scriptures that the pastor of the congregation must be 
male. He must be a man. The church, being, arch being archetypal of humanity, is to embody the original Adam-Eve male-female relationship, a truth that grounds Paul's teaching about order in the church. As pastors, we are stand-ins for Christ to the congregation, his representatives. We have a responsibility to lead, teach, provide, and protect, or to put it succinctly, to shepherd the flock of God. Good leadership doesn't always mean that women will respond faithfully. If Yahweh's bride didn't respond faithfully to him, she, always, should we expect that she will always respond to his representative leadership faithfully? Our responsibility is to provide everything God has called us to provide so that the woman has all the gifts she needs to do what she's called to do. Whether the, to equip the saints for the working of the ministry. Whether the congregation admits it or not, they do need and look to the pastor for leadership. Sometimes we get confused about this because of the way they act toward us. Always pushing us. Well, that's understandable at one level. In the beginning, the woman was thrown under the bus, so to speak, by the man who refused to lead. And since that time, she has been anxious about his leadership, whether or not he's going to have the strength and fortitude to lead. If the serpent comes, is he going to hand me over to the serpent another time? Now, occasionally, sometimes consciously, sometimes unconsciously, she will test the husband, challenging him to see if he has the resolve to stand up to her and tell her, no, you may not do that. If he doesn't, she loses respect for him and she loses trust in his leadership. If he can't stand up to her to do what is right, why should she expect him to stand up to her enemy when he comes to attack? There are many aspects of our leadership that will be challenged by the congregation. Some of it is done out of vicious rebellion. Some of it is done out of anxiety, wondering whether or not you are going to be the man. Dealing with anxiety like this with your own wife in your home has its own challenges. But your household is a training ground for your relationship with the church. For you must rule your own household well so that you can know how to rule in God's household, as Paul says in 1 Timothy 3. Dealing with this anxiety with the congregation takes it to a whole new level of difficulty as multiple relationships are involved and the dynamics are intensified. If our congregations are going to have a chance to do what is right and be steadfast in the midst of an ever-changing, highly anxious world, we must provide the leadership that they need, which will include enduring these tests. The need of the hour is deliberate, self-conscious, faithful, obedient, masculine leadership from men. Women can't do what we are called to do. To abdicate our responsibilities as men, forcing women to step up, whether through our laziness or through some misguided idea of female empowerment, will continue to create explosive situations in the church as well as other areas of societal life. Steadfastness depends upon men being men. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the callings that you have given to each of us. And we respect all of these callings. We respect our masculine calling as men and the feminine calling of women. But I do pray that as men we would do the things that you have called us to do in our homes, in society, and particularly in the church, so that we can provide for the church, and you can provide for the church through us, everything that she needs. We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Thank you, Bill. Okay, we have a 45-minute break to 1045, and we'll re reconvene.